What I'd like to do in this video lecture is briefly take a look at the political fallout from the Athenian defeat in the Peloponnesian War, and also bring one of the great figures of Greek civilization into this discussion. In your assigned reading for this unit, you will get a background on the Socratic philosophy that the Athenians are known for, and I do want to bring Socrates himself into the context of events that we've covered thus far. As you can see here, that after losing the Peloponnesian War, it's no surprise that the Spartans will abolish the Athenian democracy, and uh, the Spartans will mandate that Athens be governed by oligarchy. They even handpick the government, which will be called the 30 Tyrants, because it will be comprised of 30 prominent Athenian oligarchs, who agreed to collaborate with the Spartans. So the 30 tyrants take charge of Athens and are basically bolstered by a Spartan military garrison. They take some very unpopular measures in an attempt to ensure that the radical democracy is never resurrected. Understandably, these oligarchs quickly become hated by the rest of the Athenian population. Now, uh, one of the 30 tyrants was a guy named Critias, and it so happened that as a younger man, he was a prominent student of the philosopher Socrates. Now, you may know that Socrates is known primarily as a moral philosopher. He ultimately wanted to discover the principles that would lead to living the good life, with good being defined by what we would refer to today as virtuous. Now, as a young man, Socrates was very much interested in what we would refer to as an early form of science. He was interested in discovering the nature of things, uh, natural phenomena, and things like that. But as Socrates grows older, he becomes obsessed with finding truth. He wanted to find the true nature of all things. And he developed a method called elenkos, which was a type of cross-examination method in which he would busy himself throughout the day asking his fellow Athenian citizens such things as, what is piety? What is justice? What is virtue? What is truth? And he would ask random people those questions as he came across them in the marketplace or other public venues. Now, as you can imagine, Socrates earned a reputation as being somewhat of a pest, and, you know, his, his method of cross-examination was rather annoying because he never let you go until you wound up contradicting yourself. So, ultimately, you wound up feeling very foolish every time you talked to Socrates. Now, Socrates himself never wrote anything down, but we think we know enough about him, primarily through his chief pupil, Plato, uh, a subsequent philosopher, and also the Greek historian Xenophon, who wrote a, a continuation of Thucydides' history. And Socrates also makes an appearance in some of the comedies of uh, Aristophanes, who pokes a lot of fun at Socrates and his methods. Now, thanks to these sources, we do, we do know enough about Socrates to know that many upper-class Athenian youths really became enamored of his method and his teachings and of Socrates himself and begin to challenge the conventional notion of what constitutes proper behavior. Indeed, Alcibiades was one of Socrates' uh, more notorious students, and as a young man, he gained quite a reputation as a rebel. And of course, uh, throughout his life, as you remember from previous lectures, Alcibiades was always pushing the envelope, and ultimately, he would be accused of a very serious incident of sacrilege at Athens. So what is annoying to the families of these youths who have fallen under the influence of Socrates is that these young boys are using this cross-examination method, this elenkos, uh, to come home and make the elders look foolish within the household itself. So... Through all this, Socrates gets a reputation of undermining the traditional sources of authority in Athenian life. And because he's causing a lot of young men to act contrary to how young people are supposed to act uh, by questioning their elders, uh, that kind of thing, uh, 
that Socrates ultimately becomes associated with a process of corruption, corrupting the youth. And this, of course, uh, can be looked upon as undermining the fabric of democracy. What also becomes problematic for Socrates is the fact that a lot of the young men who wanted to study with him and study his methods, they tend to be of the upper class. And on occasion, uh, Socrates was believed to have uttered some potentially anti-democratic remarks. Um, particularly, uh, Plato ha has uh, some ideas of uh, philosopher kings running the government. And uh, it becomes uh, a trend in some of Socrates' remarks that he was not a fan of a type of government in which the average person, without any kind of knowledge or understanding, could be placed in positions of authority. So all this together, you know, creates an image of Socrates as potentially troublesome. And of course, uh, the worst of the 30 tyrants who are now governing Athens, uh, Critias, was one of uh, Socrates' students. So there is, that, again, that type of guilt by association. And the 30 tyrants as a form of government does not last very long. Uh, shortly after the Spartans withdrew their military garrison, uh, the oligarchy is overthrown. And by 403, uh, the full democracy is restored. Now, the official policy of the restored democracy was no reprisals uh, against political enemies. Uh, this is a society that has uh, been wounded both by the war and by the post-war infighting between the oligarchs and the rest of the population. So there is an attempt to heal these wounds by discouraging any type of reprisal or revenge. But we get a sense that perhaps Socrates does get caught up in the restored democracies wanting to prevent a future undermining of democratic principles. And as uh, Socrates had been the teacher of this guy, Critias, uh, who was the most notorious of the 30 tyrants, uh, Socrates, again, may have suffered some sort of guilt by association and is formally accused of corrupting the youth of Athens and impiety towards the gods because there was a sense that Socrates was not showing the proper respect for the traditional gods of Athens. And this was likely because, uh, you know, uh, Socrates was associated with a school of philosophers called the Sophists, who, uh, in part, one of their um, main foca focal points was to uh, look for natural phenomena to explain things rather than, uh, you know, the gods did it. So Socrates was wrapped up with the Sophists uh, as being uh, also a kind of highbrow critic of traditions and religion, and uh, he was associated with this guy, Critias. So when the democracy is restored, Socrates will soon find himself on trial for those two crimes of corrupting the youth of Athens and impiety toward the gods. Now, our best accounts of the trial of Socrates are through four of Plato's dialogues, uh, the Euthyphro, the Apology, the Crito, and the Phaedo. And Socrates, of course, is going to defend himself, and he will do so by noting that the case against him is a kind of prosecutorial overreach. And he actually links his case with an earlier occasion uh, in 406. You may remember uh, the Battle of the Argonuse, uh, where six Athenian generals uh, who have returned to Athens after the battle are... Uh, put on a mass trial, they are unfairly tried together, and then executed uh, for the crime of failing to retrieve the body of dead Athenian sailors. So Socrates actually had been on the committee that debated whether or not uh, during this trial it was constitutional to try the six generals all at one time. I mean, according to the ordinary procedures, every citizen gets their own individual trial. Uh, but that uh, policy was waived uh, for this particular case. Uh, 
So uh, Socrates had back then spoken out against it, this uh, unconstitutional uh, uh, breach of, uh, of uh, justice. He said that this is bogus. Um, but, of course, uh, the trial went ahead anyway, and uh, those generals were ultimately executed. So Socrates reminds the jury that he feels like he's being railroaded just like those generals had been and that he had stood up against the mob then and he's willing to stand up to it now. Now, such a statement does not really make Socrates uh, that many friends on the jury. So given the circumstances, it's no surprise that Socrates will ultimately be found guilty and will be sentenced to death. And although he is given the opportunity to uh, escape, he refuses this opportunity and chooses death by drinking a cup of uh, the poison hemlock. And ever since then, it has been debated whether or not this trial was fair or whether or not Socrates had somehow been his own worst enemy. I mean, he does display at times a rather arrogant streak throughout the trial proceedings. And it is interesting to note, as Martin points out in your text, that at his trial, uh, he is found guilty by a majority of the vote, a rather slim majority. But then when it comes time to determine his punishment, Socrates is given um, a chance to address the jury and speaks arrogantly to them. And more of the jury will actually vote for the death penalty than had originally sentenced him to a guilty verdict. So he was provocative all the way to the very end and is now considered a martyr to free inquiry and philosophical freedom, uh, no matter how difficult uh, it is to recognize what is truth.